Welcome, everyone, to um, what I hope will be uh, a thought-provoking and interesting uh, webinar on the Social Care Innovation Network. Um, it's certainly sunny down in London. I hope it's sunny where you are, although I can see that someone's already said it's drizzling in Sheffield, so not sunny everywhere. But anyway, we're nearing the weekend, and I'm hoping this is a, an interesting uh, webinar that we could all get, uh, get, get stuck into. So my, my name is Ewan King. Uh, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Social Care Institute for Excellence. I'm really pleased to be joined by Alex Fox, the Chief Executive of Shared Lives Plus. We've got our colleagues contributing to this as well from Think Local at Personal. And Anna Seva Wright will be joining us um, as well with, with her views and, and, and insights. So, so thanks, thanks a lot for taking the time out for your busy uh, diaries to take part in this. Um, the purpose of this webinar is to update you on what we think is uh, an exciting initiative, which is the creation of a social care innovation uh, network. We want to tell you a bit more about the network. Uh, we want to talk about some of the principles and research that underpins the network, why we've got to where we've got to, basically. We're going to update you on what we've done so far and what we are learning about the challenges and opportunities. Uh, and then we want to have um, uh, some questions and some discussion from you all about what our emerging priorities should be. We've got some insights on what those emerging priorities should be. We'd like your views and comments uh, on those. Everything that you hear today will be recorded the questions and answers, the slides, the, the, the recording, and will be posted and made available on both the Sky website and the Think Local App personal website in about a couple of days. So, so look out for that. So you won't miss anything um, if you have to leave early or if something wasn't clear, you can come back to the text uh, later. So um, what I'm going to do now is, um, is kick off with just a bit of an introduction uh, to, to the network. Um, and then uh, we'll hear from, from Anna and Alex. That's us today, smiling, looking really chuffed um, uh, in the photo. Um, the agenda, as I've said, uh, will involve talking about the, uh, the Social Care Innovation Network. We're going to hear from our colleague Anna about the importance of, of co-production. We're then going to hear from Alex um, about uh, innovation and how we scale innovation. And then we're going to look uh, in a bit more depth about uh, the work of the network, what we've done so far. And then we'll have, we'll leave a, a fair bit of time at the end for questions and answers. Okay, so the purpose of the network um, is, um, it was funded by, it's funded by the DHSC. Um, it started about four months ago. And the primary purpose of the network is not so much to identify new forms of innovation, New innovations are always welcome, but the purpose of this network is to look at how we can take already promising uh, innovations in care and support and bring those uh, to scale. We know there are so many good pockets of, of good practice around the country. The question we're trying to ask through the network is how we take those pockets of good practice and bring them into the mainstream so that many, many more people can benefit from person-centered, strengths-based innovative forms of care and support. So that's what we're trying to grapple with through this, through this network. Okay, so I've gone backwards. Okay, a bit more about the network. So we're bringing together uh, a combination of national bodies, innovative providers, commissioners, and citizens to identify ways to support each other to grow innovative uh, models of care at scale, to use, to use the jargon. We're not doing this uh, from a blank piece of paper. We're building on a number of pre-existing initiatives, including um, the Building Community Capacity Network, which is uh, convened by I Think Local App Personal. And we're also building on a, a, an initiative called Social Care Future, which is really a social movement committed to changing the debate about social care and finding new ways to deliver social care and, and really offering a promising future uh, for social care. We're building on that, uh, that initiative. Um, we are initially focusing on a small group of councils that are already demonstrating progress in scaling innovation and providers drawn from Think Local App Personal's Directory of Innovation. There's a number of really exciting examples of care and support on that directory. We brought them together in this initial phase of the, of the network to, to, to explore how we can scale innovation. We've held, we brought together an advisory group comprising many of the, the, the recognizable national bodies involved in, in social care, but also many from outside social care as well. 
and that, that group has met twice so far. We uh, have held one large-scale workshop, which I'm going to talk to you about in a bit more depth shortly, and we're planning another one in June. And we will be producing some what we hope will be practical and useful learning resources later, later in, the, uh, in the summer. We have asked all of the participants in the network so far to do us uh, to, to complete a survey, um, some homework, um, really, that will that sets out what they think the, the critical barriers are and what the opportunities are to scale innovation. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. And um, we're really excited by the fact that over 500 organizations and individuals have registered an interest in the network. And in parallel, um, we're doing some, some research to look at what the evidence uh, tells us about how we scale and, and foster innovation in, in social care. So it's a, it's a, it's a broad range of activities. As I said at the start, this is only a, an initial phase of the program. We do await uh, a decision from, from DHSC about uh, further funding for the program. We're hoping that that will arise and that will enable us to, to greatly expand the scope and the depth of the work that we're doing through, through the network. As I said, we're building on a number of really exciting initiatives already out there. Um, social Care Future um, is a social movement that's seeking to um, find very different ways, uh, very different ways to deliver care and support that are more people-centered, more community-led and strengths-based, asset-based in the way they're delivered. So we're trying to build on that. We're constantly connecting uh, with, these, uh, with this initiative and we're keen to connect with other initiatives out there that we may not know about. So do, do post comments about initiatives that you think we need to know more about and connect to. These are the organizations, if you can read them, then maybe the print's a little small. These are the organizations involved in the network so far, a number of local authorities, providers, and a, a range of national organizations. But I do need to emphasize again, this does not mean that the, this is, these are the only organizations engage, engaged in scaling innovation, absolutely not. But these are the initial organizations we can, we can work with through, for a limited period of time with a limited amount of funding, at least, at least in, the, in the initial period of this, of this network. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to my colleague, um, Anna, um, uh, who's going to talk about co-production and how that underpins the work we're trying to do for the network. Good afternoon. Innovation really matters to me as someone who uses social care because I can see not just the large not just the large challenges and issues current. Good afternoon. Innovation really matters to me as someone who uses social care because I can see not just the large challenges and issues currently facing social care, but also the possibilities and ways things could be better. If social care exists, not just to keep people clean and fed, important as that is, but also to enable them to live their life in the way that they want to, to be part of the community and have a sense of well-being, then the people with the expertise on their lives are the people receiving services or caring for those who do. Think about it. Who knows more about your life than you? So by co-producing, you can tap into that expertise and combined with the people working in the social care sector, be truly innovative. It might feel scary, but everyone has the same interest in producing social care that better meets the needs and wants of citizens and the workforce while being sustainable for the future. It can be difficult to see how one's vision as professionals is filtered through the system. And the great thing about people outside of it is they bring creativity and aren't limited by their knowledge of the system and the that's how we always did it. So what are the ingredients to allow true co-production? It can't be tokenistic. People can tell straight away and you will end up with the same social care just slightly tweaked. Co-production means starting with a blank sheet of paper, not a project plan, as the innovation happens at the start and throughout the process. Be honest about what is consultation and what is truly co-production. It means being really prepared to share power. Everyone's opinions and ideas are equally valued. Job titles have no meaning in co-production. It's important to get a really varied group of people, people who access services, carers, people from the VCSE sector, members of the workforce from different levels and buy-in from senior leaders. The people involved also need to represent the diversity of the population served. 
Because of this, meetings need to be different. Scrap the jargon. Meet somewhere people actually want to be and feel comfortable and at a time that suits them. Even just changing structures opens up the space to do things differently and therefore allow innovation. It may sound like hard work or a bit scary, but if you put the effort in, things really do change and innovation can flourish. A practical tool that can help is the refreshed Making It Real. Making It Real was totally co-produced with a large group of people and describes what good looks like, both for services and for someone wanting a good life. The I statements are from an individual's perspective and the we statements from the organisations. Making it real can be used when working with individuals to ensure that what matters to them is at the core of their support, but can also be used by organisations and commissioners to start conversations when co-producing change. Some ways people have used it have been to benchmark where they are now, where change is needed, and then as aspirations to aim for. It starts conversations, and that's where co-production starts, with different conversations. Finally, co-production continues from the blank page through planning, delivery and the needs to continue in evaluation of innovations. Measuring the things that matter to people in ways that really capture this is essential to knowing if innovation is working and should be scaled up or needs to be changed or even stopped. Not all innovation is good just because it's new. Thank you, Anna, uh, for that really uh, impressive contribution. Anna's actually going to be online uh, later. She'll be on the chat. So if you do have any questions uh, for Anna, she's going to be able to take part and, and, get, uh, and respond. Um, OK, so um, the next contributor is Alex Fox. Um, and he's going to talk about scaling innovation and what led to this uh, initiative. Thanks, Hugh. And so uh, Shared Lives, which is our sort of Bread and Butter at Shared Lives Plus, along with Home Share. Um, uh, neither of those are new models. So I think you started by, by talking about the fact that um, this program isn't actually about new ideas. There are tons of new ideas out there, and it's great that there are. But um, our experience is that where things stop, when you've got a new, a new model that's working really well, um, things can get stuck uh, around the point that you want to move from uh, something happening in a small scale um, that uh, perhaps has been funded through grant funding uh, to something that really is embedded as part of core business. And we've seen that in different ways through our work. But then um, certainly in the work that I do with the Building Community Capacity Network, which now has about 2,000 uh, community activists and organisations on it, that's part of the Think Local Act Personal Network, um, we hear from lots of people that have things that work at a local level, but they just can't get embedded uh, as core business. Um, they're funded on pilot funding or grant funding or funding that disappears uh, as soon as austerity bites. So for, for a long time now I've just been wrestling with that idea of how do we change that and we've seen that with a model like Shared Lives it has it's one of the few that's broken through that barrier because it's at national level it's in every area uh, and some areas support hundreds of people uh, in supportive households through Shared Lives. With Home Share for a long time it, it it felt as if it was stuck uh, for scale. So um, until quite recently, home share was probably only used by about 150 older people who um, ha had a younger person usually sharing their home in their spare room, helping out a bit rather than paying rent. Uh, and then we've had another interesting sort of experience with support from Big Lottery, uh, Lloyds Bank Foundation, and seeing home share grow as well. Now more like 450 people, so still pretty small. Um, so. What is it that, that, that makes that difference, that's, that gets through those sort of glass ceilings from something that appears to work in one area to, to making it something that is core funded, that has a long term future in that area, and then something that spreads to other areas. And then when you've got a model that is in a number of areas, um, it can still be kept on the periphery. So what makes the difference? And that for me is what this network is all about. Uh, so if I click through, um, We've been working with uh, Sky and other partners, Coalition for Collaborative Care, Think Local Act Personal, um, Nesta, PPL, uh, over a number of years on various projects which are all about um, that, that idea of, of scale and how to achieve it. And for me, it's um, 
uh, you can't distinguish between um, this problem of scale and the idea of whole system change. So one of the things we've learned um, in Shared Lives Plus uh, through uh, working with intensively in a number of areas is one of the things that needs to happen is it's not just about a particular model doing its job really well. Um, that's obviously important. You need to make sure you've got a model that's functioning, that can um, that, that has some way of measuring its impacts, uh, that has some kind of research around it, some kind of evidence base that has that kind of infrastructure in place. But you can put all that in place and that isn't enough on its own. So what needs to happen actually is, is change in the wider local system. If you drop a model on this, uh, you can see on the slides in the six innovations paper that Helen, San Helen Sanderson pulled together. Um, if, you, if you drop one of those asset-based models um, that has a real community focus, it's all about connecting people, finding out what people can't, can do, um, and being an ally to, to them, not just trying to fix people. Take one of those models and drop it into a stressed local system that doesn't have enough money, and that's used to thinking in a very medical way. And those models won't grow and thrive, usually, um, because the rest of the system will ignore them, uh, or actually even uh, actively try and reject them in favour of models that it's more familiar with. So um, the asset-based area, which um, is a Think Local Act personal paper, uh, worked with, we, we, we co-produced that with members of the Building Community Capacity Network, and it just sets out 10 very simple points that um, an area can take to try and think assets uh, in everything that the area does. So starting with understanding what its assets are, making sure that an area hasn't just done its uh, joint strategic needs assessments and worked out what all its needs are, but it's also got a really clear sense of its assets. And that's not just state services, that's um, what the voluntary community and social enterprise sector is doing, what citizens are doing, what people are doing for each other, sometimes uh, right at the grassroots. But then also thinking about um, uh, having understood what you can build on, how you would build on those assets through changing practices, uh, uh, sharing more power with citizens, uh, investing in, in community models, but also <coughs> supporting the role of local enterprise, local businesses um, as part of the, uh, the community infrastructure. Um, so the, the early work of the, um, the network, I think, has, has sort of taken some of those themes and, and tried to build on them. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about this rainbow of different approaches, um, which will be on the Think Local Act personal website very shortly. Um, and it's also being turned into a, uh, an online catalog. So uh, th this, this is just a, a attempt to show that there are a number of models out there. It's not a comprehensive list at all. There are um, dozens, um, possibly hundreds more models uh, out there. And one of the things that we'll be doing with the, the catalogue is trying to capture as many of them as possible. So if you uh, are working in this field and you don't see your organisation uh, on there, uh, get in touch with Caroline and Tim. I can see Caroline Spears um, uh, in the comments section there, um, typing away busily there. Um, uh, get in touch and ask to be part of it, because we want what, one of the things we're trying to do here is to make it easier for... Uh, local commissioners and funders to understand the range of models out there and how they might fit together. So this rainbow that um, uh, Nesta um, put together just shows that there are uh, people doing things differently uh, in every part of the system. And sorry if the text is a little bit small, but the, the version that will um, go online will be uh, higher res and easier to find than that. But at the, the centre of the rainbow, you've got people who are closer to the acute end of the system. They might be trying to leave hospital, regain their independence. Then people who um, require significant support. They're, they're looking for accommodation and support. Then people who are living in their own home but need support to do so. Um, people who uh, need a bit of extra help to do the things they enjoy or to do meaningful or work-related activities during the day. And then the <coughs> wider community um, who uh, need um, support to ensure that community is inclusive, that people are resilient. And you can see that there are different models which take those connecting asset-based approaches across the, the rainbow. So just to um, pick one out in the outer rim there, gig buddies, matches, uh, people with learning disabilities and non-disabled people around their shared music tastes. 
so they can go to gigs together um, and uh, that's an initiative from Stay Up Late um, who are called Stay Up Late because they noticed a long time ago that people, one of the ways in which people with learning disabilities weren't able to, to um, be completely included in the community was having to fit their social lives around shift patterns rather than um, getting to go to gigs or um, the cinema or whatever else it was um, and um, stay up late like the rest of us. Um, and then if you look uh, sort of further in, say, at um, Compassionate Neighbours, that's uh, coming a model from a hospice sector which is really rethinking what volunteering can look like um, and helping people uh, connect with their neighbours uh, when people are a family's experiencing um, end of life care um, uh, in, in a new way which, which doesn't feel like traditional volunteering. So um, we know these models are out there and I think for me what the, the purpose of the, the network um, is we need to uh, connect ourselves, so how can um, people who are working in this field in the kind of the provider sector connect with each other better, share resources and learning perhaps, how can local areas that are starting to do things differently connect with each other and learn about um, how to commission for innovation for instance. But um, also we, we need to, to break through some of the ways in which I think we get a bit stuck around this. So um, if you talk to people about why has a certain area um, done things differently and been able to transform itself, you'll often hear some quite familiar things. You'll hear that there was great local leadership, that there were really good local relationships, that um, uh, there was good relationship between um, uh, people uh, in leadership positions in the NHS and social care, for instance. Um, or there was good political support from local councillors. Um, all of those things are true, but they're not very replicable in areas where that may not be the case. So um, we, need to, we need to get beyond that. We need to, to, to find things that help, uh, that are more than just local leadership. Um, so, and I think we started to, to sort of, in, in the first event and in the research we've done, we've started to find some of those things. and. Um, uh, you and I think you're going to sure. um, uh, talk to us about, about some of those in a moment. Thank you. So, thank you, Alex. So, um, what have we done so far and what have we learned so far? Um, as I said earlier, we, we held our first um, major uh, event, um, bringing together the, 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 the network uh, to think about what were the challenges and what were the opportunities out there for us to, to scale innovation. In advance of that, of that event, uh, we asked all of the local authorities and all of the providers to um, undertake some homework, uh, basically complete a survey. Um, and we're going to make this information uh, available uh, soon because uh, there's a lot more that people told us about than I'm going to talk to you about. Um, and one of the questions we asked was, what did you find most difficult and why? And this Venn diagram just describes very briefly some of, some of those challenges. So for councils, um, there were real concerns about how you shift investment from um, sometimes very low cost, uh, sorry, high cost, but also poor uh, quality uh, um, services uh, towards more preventative community-based models. How do you actually make that happen? Because it's very difficult to, to make that happen. How do you map the, the broader assets that exist within communities, within families, and which individuals hold. Uh, how do you actually do that? Uh, for both providers and councils, there were lots of shared challenges. Lack of funding is an obvious one. Uh, we've heard more about that from, from the King's Fund today. Um, but also, how do you redesign the way in which you uh, contract, procure, and commission services so that they become more personalized, person-centered, and outcome um, how do you combine that um, development of an empowering vision for change and not fall into the trap of micromanaging everything, which we, we all have a tendency to do? Uh, and for providers, just to pick out um, what they thought was really critical, they sometimes struggle to understand how the whole system fits together, how they can contribute to the development of, of pathways uh, and service referral uh, routes that then they can, can help um, influence and actually become part of the delivery of, of services. So they really do, you know, find it a struggle to understand how it all fits together and how they can influence uh, the design and commissioning of future services. I think we sometimes hear that from, from both sides where you're 
um, the commissioners are aware that there's all this this good stuff out there, um, but sometimes find that world a little bit confusing. I think I talked to lots of commissioners who know that they like these models and they need them, but actually, um, you know, are, are, are struggling to distinguish their home share from their shared lives or their their local area coordination from their community connectors. So it feels as though there's that sort of there's something about how the how people working in this field, people who want to fund and invest in this field, understand each other better. Um, I don't know if that's the same in your experience. Here. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I think when I've talked to Alex about this before, I think mean, one of the things that we could produce from this work are some clear uh, templates for commissioners that just help them understand these different models and how you you go about commissioning them, how you go about uh, growing them. So that's absolutely. Um, okay, just moving on. Um, so we we held an event about two and a half weeks ago. Um, actually, it was three weeks ago, and um, we brought together the whole network. Uh, had a really good attendance, given that it was a Friday afternoon. Um, we had lots of um, people with lived experience, local authorities, and national organisations taking part. Um, we wanted to try and help people um, break out of their of the day-to-day the -day jobs they do in the organizations that they work uh, with. So we, we, we thought we would run a simulation exercise which actually asked people to imagine working in, a, in another place, in a, an imagined but realistic setting. So we created a simulation about a place called North Town um, and we asked group, people to work in groups at their tables as if they were an innovation board and ask them to actually develop plans for how they would create an asset-based area by 2020 and how they would shift resources from, from services they don't think are delivering anymore towards services that people actually want. Um, and it was a really interesting exercise. We got the, 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 te the te each table developed a plan and they presented that plan to an expert panel, included Anna, who you've already heard from, uh, and others to, to almost uh, test whether that plan would actually um, work in practice. And through that process, um, some really interesting ideas arose and some really um, interesting challenges were identified. So what that, that event helped us do, I think, was develop the raw materials we need to, to, um, to, to, to take forward through the, through the network. I don't know, Alex, if you were on the panel um, at, the, at the event, what did you, how did you feel um, it went for you? Yeah, I thought it was it was really interesting to um, uh, not just to hear some of the challenges, but also I think to see some of the ways that we we work together um, and people in different roles trying to communicate across those those boundaries. So some of the dynamics of that were really interesting, and I think that's part of um, what we we know the challenges are. Actually, how do we take people who've got very different kinds of knowledge and experience, and from that get new ideas? Because I think we do have a tendency. To, um, to exist in a little bubble. So, um, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to people who um, have similar views about how we work with communities. And um, uh, actually, we need to be able to break out of those bubbles. And I think one of the exciting things about, about the network is trying to bring those different voices together. Because um, I, I, I personally, I feel very strongly that um, new ideas begin through getting new people in the room. Um, and I hope that's what we're going to do more of as, as the uh, as, the, as it goes on. Brilliant. Okay. Um, almost it for me. Um, so, um, some merging uh, challenges that we think um, uh, we need to, to work to work on. Um, we heard a lot about leadership, and, uh, and that's probably uh, not a surprise, but we heard about the need for a very different kind of leadership, which um, enables both uh, top-down, the top-down things that we need to do to come together with um, a bottom-up view of how, how um, things need to change. Uh, so we need to share power uh, in practice. And we saw, as Alex alluded to there, we saw um, that being played out on the tables, uh, different ways in which we could work together and share power. I can see Natasha in the comments there saying, really like the simulation approach. It makes you think differently when you work collaboratively. So. Thank you. Um, so um, we also heard that uh, we need to convene a broader coalition of, of the willing, people who um, are committed to a different way of delivering care and support. And that means thinking and working with uh, people beyond the confines of traditional social care, people involved in universities, people involved in, in transport, in, in, in local enterprises, 
um, so that we get uh, cultivate that broader commitment to, to change. Um, we heard about the tension between how you grow innovations through almost uh, an industrial approach um, and how that can clash with um, uh, that can lead to the imposing of a kind of dull uniformity. There's a real danger that as you grow what were initially community-driven local initiatives which people loved locally, how you, how you develop those initiatives without losing, uh, losing what their original purpose and, and, and why they were successful in the first place. I think, I think there's, some, there's some interesting models out there as well and I think some, uh, people are starting to explore models which look more like franchises, for instance. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that's one of the things that I find gets in the way of innovation is people have that sense that if we try and um, industrialize this, we're going to kill it, and that's probably true, but actually that isn't the only way to try and grow things. Um, and interestingly, people often mistake shared lives for a franchise uh, because it, it has that consistency. There is um, you know, the same model, the same basic framework in all um, areas of the UK, um, but actually it's a franchise that nobody owns. Uh, everybody is, who delivers it is independent um, and um, uh, they don't have to be part of that kind of national infrastructure, although most are. So I think trying to work out that balance between uh, you need some kind of consistency um, if you want the same thing to, or roughly the same thing to happen in different areas, but actually um, if you go too far down that, that um, route, you just end up with the latest bureaucracy. And the issue of equalities um, yeah. was raised um, a number of times, and I think it can be missed as a as, an, as a vital uh, issue um, uh, if we're not careful uh, when we're developing innovative models of care. So um, that was something that we needed to think about very hard over the next few months as we develop the network further. And we also heard about the importance of people at the front line um, and and in middle management levels, people who are often feeling the pressure of, of um, worsening financial situations, rising demand, but not necessarily feeling that they have the power to, to, to change things uh, positively. So we heard quite a bit of, about that. Okay, and what's emerging so far? Uh, we tested these priorities out with the advisory group uh, just last week, and, and these are some of the areas we think we need to do some more work on. Uh, first of all, we think we need to have a bonfire of the forms. Um, uh, we need to, un, you know, get back to the to to to, to where it all started with self-directed support, and we're going to hear a little bit more from Anna about that. Um, we think we need to broaden potentially the definition of co-production to encompass providers as well. Um, we think we need to do some work around redesigning commissioning. We think we need to take the asset-based area model that uh, Alex talked about earlier, and we need to actually um, test that out in more depth, uh, more comprehensively in a local area or two. Um, and we need to think about um, this broader whole systems approach. We have integrated care systems now. We have these wider um, place-based uh, structures taking shape. How do we use those, utilize those to, to drive whole system change. We have the Making It Real um, uh, framework, which Anna spoke about. How do, we, how do we make that a real catalyst for, for, for change? And finally, do we need a, uh, not a green paper, dare I say, um, but, a, but a manifesto that tries to capture this, this, the essence of why we need to do what, the scaling of, of innovation? Um, so um, just moving on now, and back to Anna. I have been receiving a direct payment for six years. I, have been I am really grateful that it allows me to employ my own PAs, people that I choose myself, and gives me flexibility over their hours. However, I often feel like the paperwork, scrutiny and hassles that come with having a direct payment are a punishment for having the audacity to want one and the choice and control over my life. This wasn't the vision when independent living and direct payments were initially started. It was to enable people to live the life they want to, be active members of society, and have genuine choice and control over their lives. I just want to live an ordinary life like everyone else. To be able to do things that matter to me, give me a sense of purpose, and also have some fun along the way. But currently, I get just five hours a week for socialisation, that also has to include my supermarket shopping. 
This means that I have to choose between going to church or meeting up with a friend in the week for a coffee. Don't get me wrong, I am grateful for the 25 hours of care I receive a week. It means I can have a shower, get dressed and have food freshly prepared. However, it also means I don't have enough hours for afternoons, evenings or Saturdays, so I am home alone in those times. It is not the life I would choose as a 33-year-old. And those care hours I do get come with a cost. The audit forms are long and complicated, taking many hours to fill in. The payroll provider chosen by the local authority that I have to use or pay the difference from my own pocket, make mistakes most months and never answer their phones. And any letter that I get sent from the local authority always contains in bold that if I do not provide the information they ask within two weeks, my direct payment may be stopped. The rules are restrictive. The only thing I am allowed to use my direct payment on is care hours. And when I ask about using it for anything different, I get told, no, that is the policy. They hold all the power and want me to know it. So that is why the idea of a bureaucracy bonfire so appealed to me. Not having to fill in so many forms, but to be trusted to use my direct payment to meet my needs and to be creative and innovative about how I do that. Not feeling so at risk of my hours being reduced or accidentally breaking a rule and losing my direct payment would massively improve my well-being and reduce my stress levels. But I know that bureaucracy and paperwork equally frustrate and hinder people working in social care. I hear from many about how many forms, repetitive assessments and processes they have to fill in that take them away from spending time working with people and also make the processes about cost and numbers rather than about people's lives and their well-being. There are pockets of innovative practice, and many of those people are in this network, where they are scrapping assessments and direct payment audits. But these are the minority. How can we learn from these areas and spread innovation to get back to providing support in a way both citizens and professionals want? How radical can we get in shaking up the current way we do things and allowing a new relationship where we work together as equals, not with scrutiny and mistrust? Um. Thank you, Anna. Um, another really thought-provoking contribution. Um, Anna is still on chat, um, so is able to, to answer any questions that you might have for her. Um, I wonder if it's, uh, if it's the right time now to open up to uh, questions and I think we would certainly like to to have your reflections your questions about the emerging priorities we've identified so um, we'd certainly encourage um, you to to ask questions about that um, I was wondering if maybe about going back to um, ah, these um, yeah, yeah. the priorities and so I think one of the things we're wrestling with is um, there's so many different elements to, uh, to 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 making real change happen. We can't ignore. As I mean, you just heard from Anna. Um, if the the processes are bureaucratic and actually in reality um, oppressive, then are you really going to have a system that that develops much more human, uh, much more holistic and effective models? Um, equally, we don't just want this to be uh, this network to be about redesigning process. It also has to be about moving um, at a much deeper level towards asset-based approaches. So have we got this kind of mix of things that are about process, things that are about um, uh, support that's offered itself, things that might be more about culture? Um, have we got that balance right? And I can see Danielle's comment there, really struggle with the lack of finances to try and reach all those needs. Very frustrating, lose capacity for other things as we're so focused on funding bits. And I think um, I certainly talk to lots of people in the VCSE sector and people might be interested in the joint VCSE review, which um, looked at the role of, uh, the, uh, of charities in the health and care sector. Um, and people will talk to us in the review about um, a battle between mission and money. So community organisations that uh, have their mission set by community, feeling that they were being dragged further and further away from that vision in pursuit of funding that was set elsewhere. And for me, that's why that, that issue about power is so important. We have to be doing that decision-making uh, together if we're going to, to get beyond that. The other thing, oh, 
So the other thing that we'd really like to hear from you about are any examples uh, of where um, you and your local community have um, successfully started the process of growing something that's worked really well for, for a small number of people, but it's now working for well for a much larger number of people. So any examples, case studies, evaluations of, of where you've done that successfully elsewhere, we'd love to, we'd love to hear about those examples and make those examples uh, available. Yeah, I can see Peter's comment there. Is there an A to Z of definition? So there is a jargon buster on the Think Local Act personal website. We also put something together called the Shared Commitment to Building Community Capacity, which was an attempt to try and translate across the different sectors and say we're all talking about some quite simple ideas here, but we do tend to use different jargon to do that. Um, uh, Natasha's question, what do we mean by changing culture, I think is really important. So. Um, some of it's about changes in behaviours, um, how managers and the systems they create behave, how um, frontline workers behave, also how citizens um, are expected to behave. Um, I think there's, uh, and then behind that often is this issue of power. Um, when people talk about culture change, um, I often think they're talking about something they don't really expect to happen, it all feels too nebulous, but actually um, some of that is about very, very different kinds of behaviours and uh, the systems that would allow those behaviours um, to, uh, to be something that we all felt comfortable doing. Any other mm, So Sarah's asking, do the local authorities already involved agree with these priorities? So, I mean, they came out of the first session, but they are still up for grabs, I think, and, yeah. and we'd be interested in people's views, this feels like a, an emerging list. Can we do all of those things in this very sort of short period? Probably not. So, you know, we, we may have to prioritise. Um, and uh, obviously we are hoping to, um, to to get more resource to extend the network as well and go into these in deeper, uh, much more deeply. So, we're, yeah, we're, so we're hearing about um, an example of strengths-based model um, being only really partly implemented, I was what is, is my understanding of that comment, and the culture isn't yeah. isn't necessarily underpinning it. That's a common, common, a common challenge. So I think it's why we're emphasising the need for co-production for whole systems change, so that um, you don't just look at one small part of the system. You try to look at change right across the system. Of course, that's really difficult to do, but I but I think there is this absolute need to work across a whole system to get this right. Yeah, and uh, Leah's question sort of links in there, I think, about did the groups in the simulation have re ideas regarding how to change behaviours and attitudes of workers? And our sense was that, that workers probably want, you know, if not many people get into um, uh, charity, char the charity world, social care world, the health world, to be bureaucrats. That's not um, uh, what, what motivates people. People want to be um, more human. Um, so, but actually, is it safe? You know, if your time pressures um, and the uh, what you're expected to achieve by um, the system and by senior managers uh, feels that it's very rigid um, and it's about the throughput of people, it can be really difficult to behave differently. So, I think that behaviour change has to come from both people and from systems. Okay. Um, any other? Thoughts, reflections on on the priorities that we've identified uh, so far. Any? It's a good challenge there about private providers um, from Sophie, um, uh, and I, yeah, I think that's something we probably need to to put more thought into. Actually, I think that's a really helpful point as where as we're, we're designing uh, the the model. Um, and then Rob makes a, a good point about culture. Culture issues a major factor. Managers. In statutory organisations, especially health uh, focused on output and objective and hierarchy. Um, uh, I wrote a, um, a blog this week about um, different management styles that got a really um, strong reaction, particularly around heroic leadership, um, uh, which um, people might find interesting. Okay, Mike, but every local authority works differently, political pressures, local economics. Um, empire building personalities. Um, so yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a question, Mike, it's a question about how you how you tailor the, the, the network to work in different areas. What's 
Yeah, I think um, that's what I'm reading there is, is I think the, that sense that actually so much of this comes down to the, the individual um, kind of relationships and systems yeah. within areas. It's a very devolved system. I, my sense is that there is space to be able to um, uh, change what people expect. Um, and it feels as if there is um, certainly a group of senior leaders within social care um, who want to do this differently. And I think one of the things I'm really interested in is how can we, across the sector, get behind that, that group of people who are committed to doing things differently, help make it work and help get that out there. Um, and so part of having webinars like this, but you know, an aim of the, the network is not just that what happens in the little fishbowl, but it's actually who can see that from the outside as well. Um, and Rob's asked for a link to the blog. It's, um, uh, it's just Alex Fox blog, actually. It was uh, you know, massively imaginatively titled my blog. Um, uh, uh, which uh, you should be able to to find it through there, um, or drop me a line on uh, alex at sharedlifesplus.org.uk and I'll send you it. Any reflections on what kind of tools and resources people would find uh, helpful? Um, with the caveat that obviously um, this is, uh, as with everything, it's, we have limited uh, funding for this, but I mean, anything that people have seen out there that they found really help helpful that we can we can uh, refer to, signpost to, any tools and resources that we could produce that people would find helpful. Views on that would be would be welcome. Yeah, and of course you can always um, email these in to us as well as where we are starting to to, to run short on time. Um, oh, Caroline, uh, put a link to my blog. Thank you, Caroline. That's very kind. Um, the support, uh, the the uh, links to the digital innovation program um, run by the LGA. That is one that I think we uh, hasn't come across my radar. That you and is that? I have. Yeah, LGA? not aware of that. Um, we 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 have LGA involved in our advisory group, and I, I will absolutely ask them to to make the the documentation available for that. And we'll post that through the through the network. There is um there are a couple of web pages on 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 Sky site. Um, for the network, and we are posting useful resources on the site, and that could be another one that we post. And I'm going to set up a Ewan King's blog spot, spot <laughs> soon as well. That's really good. Um, so, okay, someone's saying multi perspective case studies, 360 degree view of how things are working. I think that's a very good idea. I think good case studies are, do provide that. Um, uh, rounded perspective of what's really happening in a, in a local area. If, if that's the right reading of that, Tracy, you want really in-depth, rounded case studies. Yeah, and I think often when you see stories of things happening differently, I'm often left just wondering, wanting to know more, you know, what actually were the factors um, that made made that uh, different? What could people do differently in other areas if they wanted to, um, to emulate that? Oh, okay. Um, I think we're nearing the end of our time with you today. Um, we um, would still welcome um, any views on the priorities that we're working on. Uh, we, we have your details now, and I hope it's okay to post you updates on what we're doing. Um, we do hope to expand the network and involve a wider range of providers and local authorities and citizens, so please look out for that opportunity in the future. Um, and we're looking for examples of where you've successfully taken something innovative, something that's really having a positive impact and grown it locally or taken it to another part of the country and made it work there. We're really fascinated by those opportunities and examples. Um, so if you go to the Sky website, um, uh, SCIE.org.uk, there's a page, uh, a section called Transformation. Um, and there's a, there's a couple of pages on the Innovation Network where we're posting blogs and articles and links to useful materials. So on that note, I'm going to ask uh, Alex to say maybe a few final words and then we'll wrap it up. Thanks, Ewan. Um, so I think I'm just going to come back to um, the point that we made earlier about equalities, actually. So I always think one of the, the tests for when things are doing well is our uh, are we doing things well for the people who are so often um, overlooked or actively excluded from, um, from, from services and support and also from, from community life? So I think the test here, and it was a challenge that came across, I think, really strongly 
um, uh, from, on the day and also from, from, from what Anna's been talking about today. Um, actually, um, as Anna said, not all innovation is good. You know, not all change is good. We need to, to be thinking about what does good look like and who, for whom does it, does it look good as well. Um, it has to be for, for everyone. Uh, we can't just be creating the next system of inequalities. Um, and that's just what I wanted to end on, I think. So thank you very much. Brilliant. So all of these um, resources, slides, Anna's brilliant um, uh, recordings will be, will be posted shortly. So, so thank you, everyone, and have a really wonderful weekend. Bye.